Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Shadow and Sun Show, and welcome back to part two of my review of Dark Sun. I got a chance to get a bit more reading in. Uh, kind of happy with that fact alone. Uh, it, it's been too long since I've been able to just get into reading a good old-fashioned book. Uh, you know, obviously this time it was a game book, but my stack of books, my to-do list is almost as bad as my uh, pile of shame. Now, as you recall last time, I went through the, about the first 50 pages. I'm going to try and knock out the rest of the the basic book, the, the more or less rules book of Dark Sun. Now, mind you, I, I probably won't ever run Dark Sun anytime soon. Maybe, maybe one of these days when, I, when I'm more in the mood for that sort of thing. But for the most part, I, I still, you know, my, my opinion hasn't changed much. I I appreciate it. I, I know a lot of people loved the heck out of it. And, uh, you know, I get that. But for me, it, it there's there's things about it, personal things that I'm just I'm just you know not in love with the the setting. But I do like a lot of the little details that make it its own you know world. You know we've all probably played in desert settings before, maybe not long campaigns, maybe maybe some of you have. I, I tend to use desert settings quite a bit just. Just to get uh, a contrast from the the, the the usual forests and hills and mountains of medieval fantasy, I guess, European-style campaigns. And for me, that was one of the things about this that was so intriguing that there there was none of that. Okay, it's its, its own thing, you know, a mix of Dune and Barsoom and... Arabian Nights and 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 you know a fair share of Conan, so I was intrigued with that and uh, some of the s simple and subtle little details really made a big deal for me. But enough of that. Let's get into uh, more of the basics. I I'm going to finish this up and then uh, hopefully next week I'll get into the Wanderer's Journal, which is all contained in this really nice hardback. I'm pretty sure it was put out by drive through but I could be wrong. Someone else could have put this out. There's really no uh, evidence of who put it out, which I, I find kind of unusual because normally uh, a drive through book has that sort of thing in it. Maybe it was done by Lulu or, or some independent, but whoever did it did a really bang-up job. It's it's. I mean, it was practically mint condition when I got it, and you know, I, I'm going to be glad to have it in my my collection. I, I wish uh, I could find the equivalent of a Ravenloft book just like this that's got it all in it, or even, you know, uh, Hollow World or Mastica. Uh, yeah. But I don't, and uh, I'll, I'll look, especially with uh, the holidays coming up, uh, especially Halloween, it would be uh, really fun to be able to do that, but I've, I've got the original box set, so that'll probably be my next deep dive, uh, starting hopefully the middle of September, so we can get a little bit of extra time in October, because, oh man, is there a lot of stuff for Ravenloft. So... Uh, I left off at Chapter 6, Money and Equipment. I'll try and show you the pertinent uh, illustrations where, where necessary. Uh, right off the bat, uh, I hate the tight-waddedness of the, the whole concept of this planet where money is super tight. Yet another excuse to keep the players down and poor, etc. Uh, the introduction of ceramic pieces for the currency uh, just, just, just gives you an idea of just how poor the, the world is. When, you know, in any other setting, ceramic would be kind of a pretty easy coin to fabricate. But there you have it. The also uh, inclusion of bone and, and jade, uh, not jade, uh, uh, 
uh, what the heck, is, obsidian, sorry folks, brain fart there, uh, weapons made of those materials just, just scream out more poverty and more, uh, more negatives, you know, with the, the negatives to hit and damage with inferior weapons, uh, not a huge fan, you know, there's some, uh, a nice inclusion of things like chariots and things like that, that, you know, would definitely help a campaign, you know, uh, it would be kind of, you know, interesting to see uh, the, the player character party, you know, riding up to, you know, the dungeon or the ruins using chariots and that sort of thing. That, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. The, uh, you know, exclusion of armor being that the environment is just so awful, you know, hot and what have you. I'm going to be doing something similar with my 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 nautical campaign because everybody's going to be shipboard wearing most of the metal armors would also be a death sentence but there will be times where they will you know go ashore quite often and you know time to break out the armor i i am at least giving my players you know uh, a chance to put that stuff on you know obviously they could you know take their armor with them in in dark sun and wait till they go underground and put it on but I think that the the entire environment would uh, would make it really unlikely that people would even bother or think about armor ever because it's just so hot constantly. The idea of wearing that sort of thing would just be just you know a non-issue. It would just never happen. There are some other interesting pieces of equipment. Uh, you know the the, the Thrycreen special weapons. I, I really, really like the addition of the, 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 the Redu, I don't know how to pronounce that, the Enix and the Kank and the Melkalot, uh, Beasts of Burden, you know, gives it a very John Carter feel, you know, uh, obviously you have to get used to the names and, you know, that they're not horses and that sort of thing. I, I, I dig that idea. One more step in making the world a, a unique place. Now, chapter, chapter 7 is magic. Uh, I've got a picture there, I don't know if you can see it, of a defiler just, you know, doing his thing, defiling the land, sucking the life out of what little there is left of the vegetation of the planet. Uh, I, I think that had I ever run this game, it would be uh, a non-stop defiler hunter campaign because they are literally what's doing the most damage to the planet. Or... or you know, maybe the opposite, uh, if I had an evil player character group where they would want to see how much damage they could do to the planet before it was nothing but a dead, dry dust bowl. Now, uh, like I've said before, I, I really am not a fan of the pulling out of the gods in, in the world that just hampers the, the, uh, the priestly ca class, the healing abilities, etc for the campaign but if you know if you're into it cool the priestly magic has uh you know a, a, a lot of magic that that's going to be taken out you know the uh, uh the templars you know using mostly elemental magic uh i would have preferred to you know still had the templars which is you know a, a neat interesting way you know to go about it but leave a couple of the gods in and, you know, just making it, you know, the last, you know, uh, battle between, you know, good and evil and, and, and see which, which side the players fall. Here, it's just, it's just too easy to slip into, at the very least, a sort of chaotic neutral mindset, you know, uh, survival of the fittest and, you know, uh, might makes right kind of world setting. I just... And it's not my cup of tea, and it, it really either makes it really easy for players to be the heroes, which, you know, I'm a big fan of, or for those, you know, in for something different, uh, very easy to become the bad guys, or at least work for the bad guys, uh, willingly or unwittingly, uh, it just, you know, it's just, it's just too, uh, fine a razor's edge. The... different spheres that they're they're uh they're able to work with to me uh, maybe i read it wrong but it seems very limiting on what they can and can't do uh 
Uh, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong on that. The Sphere of Cosmos uh, seems like uh, uh, the way to go. Uh, Wizardly Magic. Now, uh, with that, uh, you know, obviously there's the the damage that the Defilers are going to do depending on the spell level and the area that they're in. It's just it's just depressing, you know. Uh, I, I live in an actual desert, and trying to get anything to grow just fighting the sun is is heartbreaking. And uh, now throw in Defilers, where they're going to, you know potentially destroy what little is left not a big fan of that uh, the tree of life that's an interesting concept that's been used probably prior and since then in different ways uh, I'm okay with that there, there, there should be something like that it just makes sense that there would be that sort of a thing now uh, the magic section also includes uh, some things you know clarifying, you know, magic weapons and armor and that sort of thing. Uh, really, really depressing. I, I would think that there would be more leftovers from the world that was in, in the way of, you know, magic items. Those would still be around, you know, not, a, you know, an overabundance because they'd probably be hoarded, but they wouldn't be that difficult for the players to find and, you know, creating bone and, and uh, uh, you know, non-metal magic items would just be like mm, uh, no that's not going to happen uh, that's a waste of time you'd be better off just you know finding them or buying them if possible I know that's probably you know not really an option um, I'm a huge fan of the chapter 8 of experience where they define what and how each player class can gain experience points and what they get bonuses for and that sort of thing uh, that, that should have been in the game from the very beginning, you know. Uh, obviously there was for killing monsters and things like that, but the different things, uh, specifics, you know. I always had a rule where magic users got uh, XP for the spells they cast, same as clerics. Uh, you know, getting XP for money and treasure, you know, no-brainer. But a few other things in here that, that should have been put in there. As well as, you know, uh, racial awards, things that certain races would do or could do, uh, not only to, you know, gain experience points, but to flesh out their characters and to really role play, you know, bonuses for, you know, acting a certain way or doing certain things because you're an elf or a dwarf or a mall absolutely needs to be in every RPG uh, of this type. I know most games now focus on milestones and things like that, which I think uh, take away the subconscious, subtle influence and, and motivation for players to play well. I, I understand that playing well should be its own reward, but for beginners, it, it's a great way to teach them that, hey, if I do this, I get that. I'm going to keep doing this, so I keep getting that mentality. You know, uh, like I said, for beginners and, and people who haven't played in a while, it's a great motivational tool to get people to do that. The next chapter, chapter 9, is a big chapter on combat, gladiatorial uh, arena combat. Absolutely love that. If your game doesn't include one arena full of gladiators, uh, including the players fighting for their lives, at least once you're missing out on one of the classic fantasy tropes, whether it, it be Athos or uh, Greyhawk or what have you, uh, being taken prisoner, for, uh, you know, crimes they did or didn't commit and having to fight their way out. Top-notch idea. You know, obviously in, in this chapter and when concerning the arena, um, a whole lot of information that a lot of people might not be familiar with, you know, the way arenas were, were handled and dealt with. Uh, then we get to uh, you know, all of the effects of battling in the sun, and then character death, which should be permanent, but uh, no GM wants to do that these days. I, I get it, you know, you've got a player, you know, just roll up a character, and, you know, the game's really, you know, moving along. Uh, have them make up another character, you know, when they make up characters, always have a backup character. And try to make it something completely different than the previous character so that when they come in, it doesn't seem like, oh, bring in the extra or bring in the, 
the clone of the previous character. That way, you let everybody know that, uh, well, I made you roll up two characters for a reason. You might need that other one. And who knows, maybe even let them, like in Dark Sun, swap them out from time to time so that you can justify their level being what it is when they come in to replace the other character. And that way there's no wasted time of rolling up a character or the player being out of the action, which, uh, to be honest, I don't mind if a character, or excuse me, a player misses an entire session because their character died. Well, don't die next time. Uh, the, the hovering on death store rule where it goes to uh, negative hit points, negative 10 to be exact, uh, is fine. I, I, I knew too many people that used the uh, negative con score, which makes sense because you have a constitution for a reason and tends to allow people to go a little bit further than that, but I'm also a big fan of the spell death store from AD&D, which I modified depending on which system I was using, whether it's a negative constitution or uh, you know, uh, negative 10, so that, you know, uh, I, I know it gives the players a, a, a lot more, you know, opportunities to die, but I'd rather them be mostly dead than completely dead, and then, you know, everybody whining about try not being able to find a resurrect, because uh, I don't do that thing in, in my games. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do a little. If you find a rod of resurrection, good luck. Um, that, that'll be the thing. Or if you find one of those rare potions of life, that'll be the thing. But the gods actually doing it, not a chance in hell. There's just, there's no reason for them to do that unless you're on a specific quest for that specific deity and you die in, in the process. Well, that to me would be um, that god judging you and giving you a chance at a special place in his or her heaven or hell as opposed to, oh, I need this done and you're my only hope. Eh, that's a load of crap. The god could just snap his fingers and make it happen and uh, they should do stuff like that more often because in stories of the gods they kind of did whatever they wanted there were rarely things stopping them from, from doing it I know a lot of people like to have well it'll upset the balance and the other gods will get mad well good, let the other gods get mad then you have a great uh, god war scenario brewing and who doesn't love that, right? Uh, piecemeal armor uh, I've always liked those rules for you know, p finding a part of an arm, a piece of armor that survived, but the rest of it's you know rotted away or rusted away, and you know then you get the characters that, that got that sort of Mad Max look, or you know uh, mismatched armor that does kind of still look cool, you know because maybe they're made out of different metals and it gives it you know sort of a different look, a different color. Big fan. The Dark Sun Treasure Table. I've I've already gone over how Second Edition. Uh, went really, really chintzy when it came to the treasure. The percentages are identical, or they were identical, to 1st edition AD&D, but the results, how much you got, was literally all cut in half. Not a fan. I'm going to give you guys all kinds of treasure, and then I'm going to find all kinds of ways for you to spend or lose the same treasure. That's the way life is. Uh, the uh, Also notice that the value of gems is ridiculously reduced. You could find gems worth literally tens of thousands of gold in AD&D. Here, their gem table, uh, top value is 75 gold. Uh, not really not really all that spectacular. I, I want to give players a reason when they find like a big 10,000 gold piece gem to not sell it. <coughs> to think about the future when they're going to be making magic items, especially that wizard in the party who could turn that big old giant ruby into a crystal viewing device or or something like that or just a death ray jam or something like that then they <sighs> excuse me they've received the money they've gotten the xp but they're not going to spend it because they're thinking about the future love that and that's a great way to get players to to not to still not be rich because they they're not going to sell that big giant gem uh then of course there's a section of magic items things that would never exist in this world which uh, I find kind of depressing because it would be great to find magic items from the world that was you know the pre uh, desolated world only you know all, you know you find a, a, a potion of water breathing well, you know well there's no water yeah I know but this is from the old days you know who knows maybe there's an underground ocean or something that you might need it for um, 
the potions being made mostly from uh, magical berries and stuff like that. that that's a cool idea. Uh, I would use it as an addition, not as the uh, substitute for well, the lack of water. Uh, give the players another option, another way to make potions, maybe even uh, an easier way, you know, for the beginning so that you don't feel like you're just constantly handing out, you know, uh, potions instead of cool magic items to get them, you know, help them out along the way uh, and, and to, you know, to make it maybe possibly cheaper or just, a, you know, a different flavor for the potions for a while till they move on to a new location and, uh, you know, magical berries aren't so common anymore. Chapter 11, Encounters. Cool chapter, uh, you know, letting you know what monsters you're not going to find because of, you know, circumstances, their own flavor. That's cool. Uh, if there are certain things that just don't exist on a world, why have them show up unless there's some magical portal open somewhere and they're just spewing into the world, which could be fun, but Dark Sun doesn't allow that, which... Uh, I, I've gone into that before. I don't need to go into that again. Uh, just not a fan. NPCs, uh, really nice chapter on helping you run the NPCs and you know getting into their minds and, and their motivations and why they would do things. Uh, the Templars is a nice, good chapter uh, explaining just how mean and nasty and vindictive and, and corrupt these kinds of characters would be. Uh, absolutely dig it. I... I almost want to have something like that in my world, uh, but I'll probably stick with just the old, good old-fashioned Inquisition or something like that, some sort of, you know, not necessarily secret, but, you know, dreaded organization that, that might or might not actually have some authority in different parts of the world and, you know, bumping into them elsewhere, you know, uh, be careful, watch out, because they still have, you know, their power. They may not be connected to, you know, the, the, the church or the organization, but they're, you know, they're out there and they're probably being, you know, monitored through crystal balls and things like that. Just a, a, a neat idea. And, uh, you know, uh, the next chapter is time and movement and going into the year and the calendar, like anybody's going to pay attention to that sort of thing. It's great when you're writing a book, but uh, players really don't need to be bogged down with learning a new system of measurement of time or weights and measures and things like that just keep it simple for those things uh they're really you know they're gonna have a hard enough time trying to remember the names of the npcs and the, the towns and villages that they go to without taking copious amounts of notes which you know there, there's those players that do that and, and awesome give them extra xp but you can't really blame the other players i mean unless you're playing on like a uh like a daily basis or you know, maybe twice a week kind of thing, or, you know, your 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 group is really, you know, communicating back and forth uh, in between sessions. The players are going to forget. They're not going to care. They're going to be, you know, uh, let, we're moving on. We'll never be back here again. And if we do, uh, remind me that I've been here before kind of mentality. I know it's really bad, but these days, uh, at least with the people I, I, I run with uh, over the last couple of years, a lot of people either really, really care good for them or they're like you know what i just got off work i've had a rough week uh you know let's just enjoy a game you know uh keeping it as as enjoyable and simple as possible i i can you know worry about the other stuff later you know as i try to memorize all these facts and and things that you know my fighter just doesn't care about anyways uh more more uh more about dehydration and uh, water consumption and overland movement, which you know, if you've got a copy of the Wilderness and uh, Dungeoneer Survival Guide, you should be pretty familiar with these kinds of rules. Nice that they put them in here, but uh, you know, that's what happens when you go from first to second. You're going to need to rewrite everything, and it's a good place to put it, but it should have been in the DMG at the very least, so that it's just like one of those no-brainer rules that, you know, up after so many days, you start acting crazy. Uh, time and movement, again, you know, how long it takes to get, uh, you know, from here to there. All necessary stuff because traveling through the desert is very different. Sorry about that, folks. Very, very different from 
moving uh, on regular roads or or through grasslands and things like that. Uh, I think the last chapter is new spells, and there were a few interesting spells. Uh, detect psionics, fleet feet. Uh, I think that's really kind of just a haste spell uh, without the uh, you age a year kind of thing. Uh, some some issues, you know, like uh, mass for mass morph. Since there are no uh, trees, you know, and plant growth, uh, you know, cyanic dampener, absolutely a, a, a needed spell. Raise, uh, not a big fan of that. I mean, giving the, the players the ability to destroy more of the life on the planet. Doom Legion, that was kind of a neat one. You know, bring back a, an army of the dead for a seventh level spell. Uh, with, you know, unfortunately a chance that they just disobey you and go off and fight the, the war that, that they already lost. It's kind of a, a a neat spell. I'd like to see that a lot in the game, especially from, like, a, a necromancer that they're trying to track down, and every time they track him down, he just says, Fine, Doom Legion, deal with this as I make my escape. Uh, the priest spells create water. Oh, you only get half the water for the spell. Uh, no surprise there, right, guys? Um... Uh, Air lens was kind of interesting, you know, make a big magnifying glass in the air to, to, to mess with your opponents. Uh, call woodland beings, uh, well there should be other things that you can call if not woodland beings. Rejuvenate, yeah. Uh, summoning elementals made, I think they made it a little bit easier for uh, the players that, that could do so. Uh, followed up finally with create tree of life. Uh, not too shabby, but with all the stuff that's taken out, it's it's not really uh, uh, it didn't really even out the process of taking out and, you know, okay, we took this out, but we're going to give you this. It's more like we, we're taking more stuff out and more stuff out and more stuff out and we'll give you a couple of I mean, literally not even a dozen spells compared to all the spells that they've taken out. And that leads me up to the Wanderer's Journal. And I thumbed through it a little bit. It's kind of a cool picture. You know, the artwork for Dark Sun, you have to admit, was was one of its saving graces. It, it was always fantastic artwork by fantastic artists. And uh, like I said, I thumbed through it. And it's mostly uh, literally the world of, of Athos and all the different things that you're going to need to know to run it. And I am going to enjoy reading this. Uh, I always do enjoy reading things like this. Uh, when I went through the World Book of Cause for Arduin, it was, you know, just history and and facts on how the world runs, what makes it run, what makes it interesting, what makes it devastatingly brutal, what makes it fun, what makes it enjoyable, you know, what are the sources of, you know, happiness and, and strife throughout the world, you know, where are the players most likely to to find themselves when they're in their off time, the things they might be doing instead of just, you know, hanging out the local tavern. Uh, this gives you more options. Maybe even makes the the whole concept of, of shopping uh, a little more interesting because things are so hard to find and come by and rare. That That is one of the, the few things about this that, that uh, I, I think changes the overall game where every every time you try to buy something you need something uh, I would literally you know be inclined to role play it out because every little thing is so much more intense and so much more important you know finding that that 50 foot uh, uh, coil of rope is now you know a, a, a do or die situation you, you absolutely need this rope uh, because you're going somewhere and you can't do it without the rope uh, but, you know, nobody wants to cut loose with the rope, pardon the pun, and maybe, maybe, you know, bringing that back for Dark Sun wouldn't be such a bad thing. I, I know in almost every other situation, we just gloss over it. Okay, yeah, not a problem. Here's your rope. Uh, you know, toddle the F off and, you know, go do something exciting, go adventure. Uh, but in a world like this, and, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, in the world that I'm working on, uh, there are going to be some shortages. There are going to be some difficulties in obtaining things. But the ever-present threat of absolute dehydration and death 
at every step is not going to be a thing. It, you know, once they get shipboard, uh, drowning is going to be their big concern. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of just, you know, often player characters because they drowned. Uh, they're all going to be, you know, very proficient swimmers, uh, except the Hobbit. Sorry, James. Uh, yeah, call me a racist if you want, but I don't see Hobbits being great surfers, you know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, uh, swimming in a lake or something, that's way different than, you know, getting dropped in the ocean, trust me. Uh, not the same. But, uh, there you have it, folks. That's my review of the first half of the Dark Sun box set, <laughs> even though it wasn't really box. Uh, don't get me wrong, if someone said they were going to run this, uh, I'd think about it. I'd then say no, but I'd think about it. Other folks out there, they're probably like, oh my god, I love this setting. Cool, let me know in the comments section. Uh, let me know where you think I was wrong, or what have you, because these are just opinions, and I'd love to hear yours as always. And until next time, happy trails.